You mentioned Islam as a religion allows for people to believe or disbelieve in it. There's the freedom of choice in Islam. Yeah. Um, is it true that members of the Muslim Brotherhood are not to be are not allowed to be members of any other parties except the Freedom and Justice Party? Yeah. And why so? And how would you reflect upon this? Yes. Yeah. More questions? <laughs> Just to save time. Adil Barika, I'm a lecturer in this uh, department. I would like to shift the focus of discussion for now from political representation to economic inclusion. Because clearly, uh, the protests we have seen in the Arab world were fired by, um, by, by were, were in a sense, fired by lack of economic inclusion. Uh, access to economic opportunities in the Arab world are clearly restricted to a chosen few. Um, two elements of your party, two key elements of freedom and justice. And I would like to learn a little bit more about the economic dimension of both freedom and justice. Uh, in particular, what exactly is your economic vision for, uh, uh, for Egypt? Now, if I could add to this two or three little subsets of this question. Okay, I'm in particular interested in learning more about what is your view about the role that the private sector can play in an economy. Are you supportive of neoliberal economic reforms? What should be the role of the state? And in particular, the important issue of regional economic cooperation in the Arab world. Because one neglected aspect of much of this debate is that the region is not only politically repressed, it's also economically repressed. Uh, borders in the region are not just political borders, they're also economic borders. And it's immensely difficult for uh, people, goods, capital to flow from one part to the other part. And to what extent your economic vision for the Arab world includes the dismantling of these economic barriers? Can you just take one more question? So go this side. <laughs> okay. Uh, alaikum. Um, I had two questions. Um, one is, um, you've talked a lot about um, freedom and um, the constitution in reference to uh, Egyptian Coptic Christians. Um, my experience in Egypt is very limited, but at the time I did work with uh, Coptic Christians and evangelical Christians in Cairo. And the sense that I got was not that people were, and this was obviously under Mubarak, was not that people were afraid of not being able to practice their religion, but they were afraid of not being able to choose um, what religion to practice. Um, and this, the, as I understood it, this is a constitutionally um, enshrined sort of thing that people uh, were worried about. But then you also talked about how you're not going to, you're not proposing amendments to the constitution. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that, about how not changing the constitution will help Egyptian uh, Christians um, under any hypothetical um, I don't know how to say that in short, but under your party, hypothetically. And the second question is more general. Um, we've talked a lot about Egypt as an Arabic country, as a, an Arabic country, but um, Egypt has also been instrumental in very many things in Africa, in, uh, instrumental in the founding of the Af Organization of African Unity and subsequently the African Union, and has strong links. Um, I mean, right now, the negotiations with regard to the Nile, for instance, going all the way down to Uganda. Um, how does the Freedom and Justice Party see Egypt's role in Africa um, developing over the next uh, couple of years? Thank you. Uh, for the first question, why uh, a member of a Muslim Brotherhood is not allowed to be a member of another party 
as I said, and uh, as I said that uh, we have the party, Freedom and Justice Party, and the group has the same project. And the political and the work is based mainly on competition. Now, if I'm in a certain party, and I'm a, I'm a member in Muslim Brotherhood, and uh, I choose to become a member in another party other than Freedom and Justice Party. Now, when it comes to competition, which side should I be in? With my project, the party who is having the same project like mine, or another one? If we have two candidates for in a presidential campaign, one from the Freedom and the Justice Party, and another one from the party I am a member in, and I am from Muslim Brotherhood, I am a member of Muslim Brotherhood, and I have the same project, I have the same reference, I carry the same big goal of the group. Which one should I choose? So, what was said is, a member of Muslim Brotherhood, this does not apply to any other Egyptian or a member in the party. When there is a member in the party, he is supposed to be in only one party. So I cannot attend another party, and I'm not working to the benefit of the members of that other party according to what that party is aiming at or the goals of that party. It's realistically speaking, it's impossible. That's why we said a member in Muslim Brotherhood cannot become a member in another party. He may not choose to become a member in our party, but he is not allowed, per definition, to become a member in another party. That's because of the meaning, real meaning of competition. Now, talking about economics, uh, it's better to talk about uh, the real situation in Egypt. If you want to define what we have in Egypt now, I think we have a no system system. Economically speaking, we are living in a no system system. We do not follow a certain system, whether it's the free market or the social or socialism concept of uh, economics or some other things. But talking about our party, Islamic economics are quite famous and known, and it have principles that uh, been spread over by some banks and other scholars, and uh, we are more inclined to free market uh, policies as far as our constitution is respected. Uh, for the third question about Africa, Egypt have been all the time a part of Africa like it's a part of the Arab world. There are uh, five, six, maybe six countries, six Arab countries in, in, in Africa. Egypt is in the uh, northeast corner. It's a big corner of Egypt, of, of Africa. has been uh, distinguished relationships before with South Africa, with Middle Africa, with Ethiopia, with others also. Now, we've been hearing these days from the Prime Minister of Ethiopia that we don't have a problem with Egypt, with the people of Egypt. We have had a problem, that what he's saying, with Mr. Mubarak himself. He has been looking to us as if we are from other places, and they've been hearing words and uh, positions that they understood as uh, the, he didn't, or he been insulting and doesn't respect them. That's what they felt, which is very bad. Now they are moving towards better situations only because the regime has changed. Only because Mr. Mubarak is not there. He was looking to the north, more to the south. And, and uh, uh, our party, we have many common things with Africa. And, and, and the roots of the African people are quite in our hearts. They had extended. So, uh, uh, I think and uh, we intend and the real situation is uh, Egypt is a part of Africa as it is a part of the Arab and Islamic world as well. Any other questions? Okay. 
Hi, Dr. Mohammed. Uh, I'd like to thank you for coming here and to actually get to talk to the Muslim Brotherhood just rather than to hear from them. And I'm a Christian Egyptian, so it's also important for me to learn more about you from face to face rather than yeah, just through the news. So the first question I have is about civil liberty. Now as a political party, or being a mem members of parliament, which soon probably you will be, uh, you have responsibility not only to protect Muslims, but also Christians and people of different faiths, but also of different cultures. There are some Egyptian tribes that won't even consider themselves Egyptians, Nubians as well, that have their own beliefs and faiths and Bedouins. And all of these, excluding the, including the expats, including uh, people visiting and tourism, tourists, have different... Um, Definite, not definitions of civil liberties, but they drink, they eat differently, and so forth. But that also means being able to trade with these goods and so forth. So alcohol and pork and so forth. So what is the Muslim Brotherhood's policy on this? Or what would you be considering? The other one is we heard and we've read elsewhere that the Muslim Brotherhood would have problems against a... Um, a, pres a, a woman president or a Christian president that's democratically elected. Um, do you have any issues with that? No. Okay. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Said Morsi, um, you've said on more than one occasion tonight that the sole uh, source of authority in New Egypt will be the people. Uh, but that doesn't sit very well, I don't think, with the idea of a religious party who takes its authority from God. Um, so I would like to know how your specifically Islamic identity will manifest itself in New Egypt if you are not going to change the constitution and if you are going to respect the will of the people. I just want to know in what practical terms will Islam make a difference more so in the future than it has done in the past? Yeah. I had a follow-up question as well about the relationship between the Muslim Brotherhood as a movement and the political project of the Muslim Brotherhood. Last week, uh, you came on, on TV with Yusri Foda, and uh, the next day there was a response debate from some of the Muslim Brotherhood youth responding to some of the ideas that you proposed about this relationship. And um, Ibrahim al-Hudaybi, I think, was describing the diversity internal to the Muslim Brotherhood as a movement in Egypt and used the term madrasa to refer to the Muslim Brotherhood, assuming, from what I understood, that it was a, a philosophical school that could give birth to different ideological projects which would need to be represented by different political parties. You responded that it was a school of thought, um, and it, it was implied that you equated that with an ideological school, and that any differences internally would be strategic differences, not ideological differences. Do you think that the Muslim Brotherhood as a movement in Egypt can be reduced to one ideology. We can just take a couple of more questions because I think this will be the last round. Uh, thank you very much uh, for coming. It's, it's actually a very unique event to hear from the Muslim Brotherhood. We only hear from one side from the media. I'm very delighted to come here tonight. I would like to hear uh, your comments about the future of uh, making your voices heard, particularly to the West. You, you, you mentioned earlier that you've always been prohibited for being heard. And surely no one in the West is very keen to hear from the Muslim Brotherhood. And I mean, we are lucky here you have Egyptian fellows that invited you. Uh, what is your policy in the party to communicate with the rest of the world outside Egypt? Yeah. Um, thank you for your talk. Uh, I have two questions. The first one, who uh, do you think will be your main political opposer? And second, I'm quite interested in the approach that uh, this new party will have on international policy, and especially what will the approach uh, toward the Palestinian and Israel problem. Uh, 
as far as the protection of Christians as uh, protection of Muslims, this is not anyone's choice. This is a basic uh, principle that all citizens of Egypt living under the same constitution having equal rights and they all are part of the country. They are members, citizens in the general Egyptian society and they are living together. They are very close to each other. They are neighbors. What we have is really good relationships between Muslims and Christians, even non-Muslims from other religions. We have Jews in Egypt also and others. And uh, we don't have a problem in that. And we are ordered by Islam to, if, if a Muslim is responsible about the, the country, if he's a president, then he is ordered by Islam to protect uh, all citizens in the society, regardless of their belief or religion. And uh, if somebody doesn't do this, then he doesn't understand Islam, he is violating Islam. If this happened in some places in the world, and I haven't seen it happening occasionally, but sometimes we see things, so this is, this is a big mistake. This is a big mistake, it shouldn't happen. So as far as we are concerned, we're talking about Islam, we're talking about real understanding, moderate, unbiased Islam, which is Islam, uh, then we are talking about equal rights in, uh, between the Egyptian citizens, their right to uh, live in peace all together under the same umbrella, under the same constitution, under the same law, having uh, all kinds of uh, positions in the, in the, in the government and, and so on and so forth. Uh, what we've been, we been raised before about uh, uh, a woman or a Christian as a president this is uh, our opinion. This is not the constitution situation. We declared our uh, the opinion based on Islamic Sharia, which states clearly that when an Islamic country, Islamic country means the majority are from Muslims, then the president, only the president, uh, it's a mandatory according to Sharia. And there is a debate about this. And we have chosen other group this. We have raised this statement from uh, the party principles and the statements. It's not there yet, but I was, I'm trying to explain to you the position of Islam in this. And that doesn't mean there is differentiation between the Egyptians based on their belief. It's only talking for many reasons about only the president, uh, whether uh, talking about a woman or a uh, a Christian, and uh, as far as a party will practice politics and go through, we're talking about our party, not about the Constitution. We are not going to change the Constitution. We do not have the right to change the Constitution. People have the right, the people uh, have, are uh, deciding and they, well, uh, agreed upon to have a Constitution like this or a new Constitution. We are not going to violate the Constitution. We respect the Constitution. Dr. Mohammed. You can't, you're not, oh sorry. Can we just, sure. just for the sake of time, if there's any further discussion, can we make it after the lecture? Because the question wasn't necessarily. Sorry. Yeah, there's another sorry. part in the question, I'm, you said? Yes, because you might not be able to, you're not going to necessarily touch the constitution, but the constitution isn't complete. The question also was pertaining to laws. For example, with regards to alcohol, with regards to trading um, with pork and so forth, which is not necessarily an Islamic issue. It's morely to deal with people in general. Yeah. Uh, I remember when I was a member in parliament and we have a, a very uh, well distinguished uh, member, Lady Georgette, and she was Christian. And when they've been talking about uh, uh, alcohols and things like this, and somebody said this we have to leave in the society because of our brothers and, and our citizens, the, the Christians. She'd been very angry and she said, 
Alcohol is also forbidden in Christianity, it's not in Islam. So we are not talking about now going in the street and find everyone carrying his own bottle and just drinking all the time. This is just, this is just an imaginary situation. If people are doing whatever they want inside their homes, this is in Islam, they are free to do whatever as far as they do not threaten the society. No one can knock the door on any person and say, hey, what you are doing inside your house? This is forbidden in Islam. So there is a, a big, big misunderstanding in this situation. Now, when we come to power, then we can talk about the law, but we are not in power. And even if we are in power, it's Egyptian people, well, Muslims and Christians. It's not our well. And we do not have this desire to make discrepancies in the society. When we talk about alcohol, we say it's forbidden in Islam. This is very clear. Yeah. Now, if we have some other religious or religion in, in the society, people are behaving according to the religion inside their homes and they will not threaten. If anyone Muslim or non-Muslim threatens the society, then he will be violating the law. What do you mean by threatening society? Because there are restaurants, there are bars, there are public places that actually serve alcohol that, in this way, that is currently in place. Yeah. There are also duty-free shops, sh shops that serve alcohol, and not only that, but pork or other goods that not necessarily are part of Islam. Are you going to leave them alone or actually... You talk about me or the Egyptian people? No, no, your opinion. <laughs> your opinion. Yeah. Your opinion. No, my, my, opi my opinion is not is it will not be against the Egyptian people well. My opinion remains my opinion. Even if I am controlling Egypt, even, even if I am the prime minister, I do not have the right to push the Egyptian people to choose their own constitution. They will agree upon or disagree through their constitution. Everyone has got to respect the people well. Now, if you want to talk about specific small things, we can find many things that we can talk about and in the whole world. Now, every society has its own culture, principles, religion, history, commons among the people. Now, if we want to take a very small thing and talk about specific your opinion, then in my religion, alcohol is forbidden. In my religion, to me, it's forbidden. And this is, this is my right to declare it and say it. Now, if I'm living in a civic society and the constitution or the law states whatever will be in it representing the people, then I myself have to respect it. I do not have the right to change the law by myself. But the people does. So we are sometimes trying to put an imaginary situation and then try to answer questions. You know this is an iffy question, not this question, but in general. It's out of phase. It's not in the course. It's, it's, it's a question that will be answered in the future when we have such a case and the people respond to it through the Constitution, which will be reflected through the Parliament to a law. And everybody in the society, when I'm here, I have to respect the law here in this place. I cannot, as a foreigner, I cannot violate the laws that are being here implemented. I, I do not have the choice to do that. But why? Because the law represents the people.